uh, will provide the state with the necessary assistance, including military, and will also provide support at the disposal in exercising the right to collective defense in accordance with Article 51 of the UN Charter. On May 14, 2002, in Moscow, uh, the Collective Security Council made a decision to grant the status of an international regional organization to the Collective Security Treaty. And on October 7, 2002, uh, the charter of the CSTO was approved. And uh, next year, in December 2003, uh, 2003, the CSTO Charter was uh, registered with the UN Secretariat. And uh, a year after, in 2004, the organization received observer status in the UN General Assembly. In accordance with Article 3 of the CSTO Charter, the objectives of the organization are uh, first, is the strengthening of peace <clears throat> and international and regional security and stability and the protection on a collective basis of the independence, territorial integrity and sovereignty of member states. The document also defines principles by which the organization is guided and uh, uh, is guided in its activities and those principles are uh, priority of political means over the military, uh, a strict respect for independence, and um, uh, voluntary participation and equality of rights and obligations of member states, as well as, most importantly, non-interference in affairs falling under the national jurisdiction of member states. And I ask you to remember this because it will be important when we will discuss the situation in Kazakhstan. So CSTO uh, has been building its capacity since the early 2000s. And um, it's my opinion, but I think this opinion is also shared by uh, not only lawyers, but political scientists as well. And um, the, uh, the quick development uh, and the strengthening of the organization was a sort of a reaction to the US military presence in Central Asia. Because perhaps you know, uh, US had military bases in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Uh, and uh, in Kyrgyzstan, we closed, uh, because I'm from Kyrgyzstan, uh, we closed the military base, the, U the American military base, I think in 2005 or 2008. And it was obviously pressured by Russia because we also had a Russian military base in our territory. And uh, I guess the, they, they, they really didn't want to have Americans on, uh, on our soil because the Americans used the uh, military base in Kyrgyzstan uh, for, for their military operations in Afghanistan. And I think Russians really didn't like it. So uh, they introduced this framework of security, uh, collective security treaty organization to sort of get rid of uh, military bases in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. And also this framework, the CSTO framework allowed members to buy weapons at Russian domestic rates. And, and um, also uh, these members, the member states are, have a common air defense system. But uh, of course, and I, I think I shouldn't uh, mention this, but everybody knows decision-making is greatly influenced by Russia. So in 2009, uh, the CSTO also established a rapid response force. And this rapid response force is, um, consists of mobile units and military units of the permanent uh, readiness of armed forces of the CSTO member states. And these special forces are formed from the number of special units of the internal affairs bodies like police, and security bodies and special services, as well as authorized bodies in the field of prevention and liquidation of consequences of emergency situations. And the total number of the soldiers involved in the rapid response force is about 18,000 people. In December 2010, uh, the CSTO adopted new rules on intervention 
And these new rules uh, allow the organization to deploy peacekeepers to deal with domestic unrest in member countries. So domestic unrest is key here because now it leads us to the events that I wanted to discuss with you today, and namely the uh, events, the, the riots uh, in Kazakhstan in early 2022. So what happened there? Uh, in the beginning of January, protests began in Kazakhstan over uh, rising gas prices. And uh, the protests also, although started just for um, just because of uh, the gas prices and the request to reduce the gas um, uh, the, uh, the gas prices um, they also transformed into the uh, anti-governmental riots and thousands of angry protesters took over the streets of Kazakhstan and um, sort of creating uh, the biggest crisis uh, uh, that that shook the country because it was so um, so surprising because Kazakhstan was considered to be one of the most stable countries in the region and nothing happens since its independence in 1991. But yeah, this year uh, was quite surprising. Um, there were a lot of uh, arsons and damages to the different inf uh, infrastructural objects uh, in the country. For instance, City Hall in Almaty. Almaty is, uh, is one of the biggest uh, cities in, in Kazakhstan. It's actually the, the largest city in Kazakhstan. Uh, so the city hall there was set ablaze and uh, angry mob took over the airport and protests set, uh, fire, set on fire um, police vehicles and um, also they uh, put on fire the, uh, the building of the regional branch of the ruling Nur Otan party and that's the party of uh, Kasim Tokay who is the president and um, in the end the police uh, in turn accused demonstrators of being responsible for the death of 13 officers and um, they also left 353 uh, officers and civilians injured. Um, it's important to mention that in 2019, there was a change in presidential leadership when Kasim Jomar Tokayev took over from Nur Sultan Nazarbayev. Maybe you heard of him. He's the long-standing leader of, uh, of Kazakhstan. He was there since the very independence of uh, the Republic of Kazakhstan. And uh, uh, as he calls himself um, El Basri, it means the leader of the nation. He named everything that could be named <laughs> uh, after, after him, including the capital. Now the capital uh, has the uh, name of Nur Sultan which is his, uh, his first name, and before it was called Astana. So, you know, people were angry because uh, Nazarbayev stayed in power uh, for almost three decades, and obviously uh, there are multiple accounts of, uh, of corruption, like uh, he put all his like family members into power or... Uh, uh, in a very high and um, uh, high positions, not only in the government but also in the private sector. So protesters were demanding not only lower fuel prices, but but also the uh, the anti widespread governmental corruption. And on January fifth. President Tokayev requested assistance from the uh, security, Collective Security Treaty Organization, and Russia very, very quickly responded to his request and, and sent troops already on the next day, so on January 6th. And uh, they sent around, <clears throat> I think, 3,000 troops. I haven't checked the recent um, uh, the recent numbers maybe was recalculated back, back, back then and was around 3,000 troops. And this was the first, um, the first time in the history of the, of the existence of the organization that um, they actually invoked the, the um, provisions on protection and collective security uh, <clears throat> that are established by the CST treaty. So now I want to shed light on an important legal question here. 
And the question is, was this troop deployment in compliance with the law of intervention by invitation, as well as in compliance with the CSTO treaty? And first, <clears throat> let's start with answering the second question. Was Tokayev's invitation to foreign troops to protect the country from potential foreign aggression, as he called it back then, also, so was this invitation authorized by the CSTO regime? And as we previously saw, <clears throat> uh, the, STO, um, uh, the CSTO treaty in its article four says that uh, an act of aggression, and they define an act of aggression by um, saying that it could be either an armed attack that threatens security, stability, territorial integrity and sovereignty. Uh, uh, so, an act of aggression against one of the member states will be considered as a collective act of aggression on all member states of the Collective Security Treaty Organization. So Tokayev's narrative was to brand the demonstrators as foreign terrorists. That was that what he <clears throat> always told in public and also appealed to the CSTO Council. And he said that his country is now full of foreign terrorists who are trying to destabilize the country. And that's why it's a foreign aggression that needs to be fought. And um, uh, I think this, this narrative uh, also allowed the Kazakh government to bring in military support from abroad uh, under the treaty. So th that's how they were trying to justify their call for CSTO troops. And now uh, Article 4 further adds that upon request of a victim state, other state members will provide all necessary assistance, including military one, as we saw, um, and as we saw in the beginning. Uh, uh, and also, importantly, uh, this military assistance should be in accordance with Article 51 of the UN Charter. And I, I bet you all know what Article 51 of the UN Charter says. <clears throat> uh, the article allows for the use of force in cases of individual or collective self-defense. And Tokayev actually exercised his right to request assistance as he as he was the head of the Kazakh government back then. I mean, he's still now, but uh, he was authorized to send this invitation. And, um, <clears throat> and now I, I wanna move to the more specific uh, elements of the collective self-defense under international law in general, not, not in the framework of the CSTO uh, regime. So the commonly agreed criteria for invoking the right to self-defense um, are the present, presence of an ongoing or immediate armed attack, necessity and proportionality. And these criteria are equally applicable to individual and collective self-defense. However, there are two additional criteria that are inherent specifically to collective self-defense. For instance, the International Court of Justice in its Nicaragua decision in 1986 uh, stated that the victim state must declare itself to be the victim of an armed attack and that the victim state must request military aid in response. So what does it mean? It means that Kazakhstan should have um, publicly uh, declare itself to be a victim, which they did by stating that they are attacked by foreign terrorists. And um, that's why they are requesting military aid in response to this attack, because they are the victim. So the pressing question now is who actually attacked Kazakhstan and from whom should it be protected? The use of collective self-defense in the absence of external aggression uh, is not codified in the CSTO treaty. And as mentioned, neither Tokayev nor Russia provided evidence that Kazakhstan is under attack by foreign, by foreign states. Yes, they were trying to use this argument that they are attacked by foreign terrorists, but nobody has ever provided any evidence that the foreign terrorists were present there. There were some articles circulating that were uh, that were stating that there are some Syrian uh, Syrian uh, foreign fighters 
present in the country, but um, but beyond that, nobody nobody even provided any sufficient evidence that this was true. Also, Kazakhstan uh, claimed that uh, there were a lot of people from Kyrgyzstan, from its neighboring neighboring country, that came there to fight. But nobody ever explained why they did that. Why would a national of a different country would come to participate in national riots in the in the in another country? And they actually arrested a lot of Kyrgyz nationals. Though, and they were and they spent some time in the, um, in prison. And when they were uh, repatriated back to Kyrgyzstan and were interviewed, uh, they said that it was completely arbitrary because they were some of them were just walking on the streets like going shopping grocery shopping and they were arrested because they had a uh, foreign passport so to say and they were interrogated and tortured and now there are some uh, domestic trials are going on in in, uh, in Kyrgyzstan they were trying to bring justice to those people who were arrested so um, getting back to the response of Russia that they sent the troops, uh, I guess the Kremlin still assumed that foreign supported domestic turmoil in Kazakhstan um, was a collective security threat. And um, maybe they were not even interested in the, in the real uh, in the real underlying reasons of why actually the riots, erupted in the country so they were they used this opportunity to um, to show that they are able to protect its neighbors and also I think it was a show off that uh, they can act uh, they can act rapidly uh, also strategically and they can achieve their um, they can achieve their goals quickly and uh, now when we are um, looking at this situation with the prism of what happens now in Ukraine, maybe we can even interpret it as a, uh, you know, as a signal that Russia is uh, is very structured and also uh, like military structured and ready to respond to uh, this kind of um, this kind of events. But getting back to the uh, international uh, law of um, of uh, uh, collective self-defense and, uh, and uh, intervention by invitation. State practice shows that the principle of non-intervention does not prohibit certain limited operations of foreign troops by invitation, because the, there is a scholarly debate, uh, and uh, if if you read like a modern modern scholarship on the um, on the law of uh, intervention, <clears throat> some uh, some are uh, some scholars state that um, the legitimacy of an invitation to influence non-international armed conflicts and and domestic turmoil is not valid in, in this regard. Because for instance, the, um, the Institut de Droit International in its 2011 Rhodes Resolution stated that military assistance is prohibited when its object is to support an established government against its own population. So the, the, the situation very similar to what happened in Kazakhstan. Yeah, they were trying to fight its own people because the people were uh, rebelling against the government. Uh, so some institutions and some scholars state that uh, the, um, uh, the non-intervention principle applies when uh, to the uh, events when um, uh, to the events of domestic uh, riots and domestic turmoil. And moreover, also the recent inter interventions into Iraq and Syria showed us that invitation alone is not a sufficient ground for invitation uh, because the states who intervened, these countries, the, the US and the, the EU coalition, um, also even Russia and Syria, they usually use the collective self-defense as the main justification. And only then they brought the arguments of, intervention, uh, of, in, of invitations.
So they were saying that we have to protect ourselves because it's a collective so, uh, because it's a collective threat to the whole humanity. And only then they were um, like, you know, in the second place, they were also trying to justify their actions by saying, but we were invited. We were also invited by official governments or official representatives or whatever it might be. So I guess this could be an explanation uh, for the fact that Russian media outlets I mean, not only uh, not only Russian, but also Central Asian. That I mean, they were using the Russian language. Uh, that are, they are still using the Russian language to deliver the news. They were um, mostly focusing uh, on the fact that the CSTO troops were deployed in Kazakhstan because. Uh, because it's a collective security threat, and not because Tokayev invited them. So uh, I found it interesting because I think the already change in the the whole intervention by invitation discourse is changing as well. And uh, also another explanation of making an emphasis on collective self-defense might be the fact that um, the CSTO and uh, Russia in particular acted very differently during the previous attempt to mobilize uh, the troops. For instance, um, in other countries, and as mentioned, it was the first collective security operation by the organization. Uh, in 2010, during a revolution in Kyrgyzstan, where I come from, and uh, the revolution that I survived, so to say, uh, the former president, uh, Kurman Ben Bakiev, he tried to request military support from the CSTO when we had a similar situation uh, that was happening in Kazakhstan this January. We also had like domestic riots that were uh, demanding the change of power and also uh, reduction of taxes and uh, also like a bunch of a bunch of stuff. We don't have to go into details now. So he requested military support, but the organization denied and uh, uh, they said no. And uh, Kurman Beg Bakir was overthrown in, um, in a few days. So the, 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 the organization was not reactive enough to help him. And also some months later, uh, the newly established Kyrgyz government, we had an interim government in the aftermath of 2010 revolution. They also requested the CSTO support to send the troops to the south, uh, to the region of Osh. Uh, it's the south region in Kyrgyzstan because there were some ethnic clashes between the Uzbek and Kyrgyz, and they were very violent. And now uh, there was after the um, afterwards there was a UN uh, fact finding mission which um, which uh, concluded that there were some crimes against humanity uh, happening uh, in this region. So the new the Kyrgyz government, the interim, interim Kyrgyz government requested the support, the, the CSTO troops. And uh, back then, Russian President Dmitry Medvedev, and yes, Russia had <laughs> Russia had different presidents once. So Dmitry Medvedev denied the request uh, because he said that it's um, uh, it's a purely domestic issue, and it's not possible to send CSTO troops. And uh, I quote him here, he said, the criteria for using CSTO forces are violations by a state or non-state entity of a CSTO member state borders. In other words, an attempt to seize power from the outside. It's under the circumstances that we determined an attack has occurred against the entire CSTO. And I think this is very interesting because they completely changed the narrative in the Kazakhstan situation um, where they were actually, the, the, it was very similar that people were protesting, but uh, in Kazakhstan, they said, no, 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 those people are foreign terrorists who are trying to, who are trying to change power in the country. And also interesting that uh, when Medvedev said that it's, it should be an attempt to seize power from the outside, or it should be an attack, an attack by other states, uh, in 2021, 
Mm, Armenia also asked CSTO and asked for its support uh, when Azerbaijan um, invaded their territory or, I mean, according to Armenians, Azerbaijan invaded their territories. And uh, Russia just said that, um, no, it's, it's not our problem. It's not, um, you have to deal with it yourself. It's your domestic issue. And uh, they offered just some mediation, mediation services and uh, assistance and border delimitation. So um, now you might ask what, what makes the situation in Kazakhstan different actually. And uh, in my view, nothing. But as I said, it's also, it's not only legal uh, decisions, it's, a, it's almost always political decisions. And I think Kazakhstan, the situation in Kazakhstan, this January, again, now maybe it's, it is my conspiracy theory, but I think Russia really tried to show that uh, what, kind of, um, what kind of weapons they have and how quickly and rapidly and strategically they can act to also maybe threaten uh, the NATO. Uh, but yeah, who knows? I don't think that this, uh, this crisis was staged. I think it was a genuine crisis and uh, Russia just used it uh, to, yeah, to pursue their own interests. And also we don't have to forget that Nazarbayev and Putin, Nazarbayev, the ex, uh, the former president of Kazakhstan, they're sort of best friends. Who supported each other all the time so i guess it was also uh, a friendship <laughs> friendship support um but importantly remember when we talked about the rapid reaction force the csto system uh, includes another document and which is this collective rapid reaction forces agreement and uh, as we saw this agreement was concluded in 2009 uh, and um, the rapid reaction force can intervene in domestic turmoils because they uh, introduced this new uh, new provision that they can react to uh, all kinds of stuff including like international terrorism security of governmental and military objects uh, like what they did in Kazakhstan, the Russian narrative was that they're going there to secure governmental and military objects. So that's why uh, they were all around the, the country securing uh, objects like airports and military bases and weapons, uh, weapons stocks, etc. And um, so this new agreement, the Collective Rapid Reaction Forces Agreement, uh, now permits using the reaction force for basically any purpose. And I'm here at the end of my presentation, but I want to hear your opinion. So after what I said, do you think it was legal or do you think it was illegal? Do you think the troop deployment was, uh, was actually legal? But before we move to the discussion, I also want to mention an important issue now, which is of course, the war in Ukraine and, uh, and what's the role of CSTO plays in the conflict. And generally speaking, um, the Russian officials claim that they're not going to mobilize CSTO troops in Ukraine. Uh, they don't give detailed explanations though, why uh, they don't wanna uh, deploy the troops. Uh, but they are just state they, they are stating that oh this is unnecessary we don't need CSTO troops we everything is going well uh, there and I think that uh, yeah perhaps they just want to show that everything is under control and they are able to deal with the situation themselves um, and um, however interesting facts in early March like a few days ago Russia requested Kazakhstan to help. Uh, and Kazakhstan refused. And Kazakhstan said, "No, sorry, we are not. Uh, we are not entering this uh, this special military operation, as they call it." And uh, I think it's very interesting, especially after what Putin did for Tokayev earlier this year. But maybe, but <clears throat> maybe Kazakhstan had its uh, own justifications. Maybe exactly, uh, exactly um, re reasoning their decision, saying that, "Look, we had uh, our own." Uh, our own stuff going on in the country, so we we just cannot afford uh, entering uh, a new um, a new conflict 
maybe that's worth their explanation, but yeah, we will probably never know. But I, I think it, it actually also doesn't mean that Kazakhstan is not supporting Russia in this conflict, because as we saw, Kazakhstan abstained during the uh, United Nations General Assembly votes um, on the resolution uh, on the uh, war in Ukraine. And they also, Tokayev, in all his statements about the situation in Ukraine, he insists that Minsk agreements uh, were violated. And uh, that is why the, the, that is why now we observe the escalation of violence in Ukraine. So I think he's trying to sit on both chairs. So he's sort of um, supporting uh, supporting the international community by not stating that oh yeah Russia is doing everything great, but also not condemning Russia uh, to the full extent. And it's interesting because, for instance, Uzbekistan, uh, recently they stated that they do not support the war, so they called the, their special military operation the war. They say that they do, they do not support the war in Ukraine, they do not support uh, Russia in this uh, conflict, and they even pledged to send um, humanitarian aid to Ukraine. So this was the first Central Asian country to do that. And I hope uh, others will follow Although Kyrgyzstan, my country, already pledged their full, <laughs> their full servantship to, uh, to Russia during the meeting uh, of the prime ministers, they said that they completely uh, support them, but I cannot blame them. They completely, they completely, um, they're completely dependent on, uh, on Russia, but which is obviously their own fault. And um, the last point um, that here is also another interesting development. Vladimir Putin has submitted for ratification to State Duma, State Duma is Russian parliament. He submitted a protocol on amending CSTO peacekeeping activities, which um, stipulates the introduction of the coordinating state concept. Uh, so the coordinating state co concept means that uh, there will be one state in the in the CSTO uh, framework that would decide on the deployment of peacekeeping forces, like where the peacekeeping forces of the CSTO will go. They're saying that it's not related to the situation in Ukraine at all. Because it happened just a few weeks, uh, just a few weeks ago, maybe a couple of weeks ago, when they introduced this new document, and they said, no, 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 it's uh, it's uh, purely bona fide, and we want to use it only when the UN peacekeeping operations are deployed. So we also want to kind of join the UN peacekeeping operations, but nobody knows. Um, uh, you know what the real plan is and I don't think that Putin does anything uh, to help the UN or the international community so we'll see. So on this note I will uh, end my presentation and uh, I look forward to uh, to, the, uh, to our discussion. Thank you so much for listening. Now I will try to switch on my camera again. In, in the interim, in the interim, let me just thank you for offering your uh, quite illuminating uh, uh, thoughts and also being quite candid with 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 them. And uh, uh, on a lighter note, perhaps I would have liked to see your cat than the dog, but uh, perhaps that's for the next time. There are two questions in the chat box which I request you to 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 address, and then um, I'll follow up with a few of my own. So I, I'll just read them out for your convenience. There. Uh, mm -hmm. and there's, a, there's a two questions in the chat box that from the members of the society. Uh, uh, he 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 asks uh, the Russian intervention in Kazakhstan was done with the view of self-interest. The Russian-Kazakh border is the second largest land border in the world. M more more so, it is very poorly manned, and a state of civil strife was considered as detrimental to uh, Russian interests. Please do kindly share your thoughts on this. And he follows it up by asking you, uh, can, Russian, can the Russian in intervention be considered anticipatory self-defense as decided in the Caroline case? But also, even in a more minimalistic setting, that is within a collective state organization having similar interests. Mm -hmm. So, the 
starting from the anticipatory self-defense, no, as I said, I don't think that this uh, this was uh, anticipatory in any in any sense. Uh, I think these riots were really um, unpredictable and unexpected. But again, I'm not a regional expert. So maybe there were some predictions. I am just a lawyer, so. Um, but uh, as a person who who lived in the region, who is a, who at least some have some knowledge about the region, I think that it was indeed not um, it was spontaneous. So it was not anticipatory self defense, and uh, they also never tried to uh, justify the actions uh, invoking this um, this uh, provision because they were saying that. It's a collective security threat because there are foreign terrorists. They never showed that there were any foreign terrorists in the country and they are going there not to fight uh, the people. And actually, uh, to be fair, they never uh, you know, shot at the, uh, at the people. They never, um, they never went to streets you know, to separate people from the military, from the Kazakh, uh, from the Kazakh, uh, Kazakh police. They really went there to secure the military object. They went to the airport, to the uh, the parliament house, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So where they were just occupying this um, uh, these places, and uh, and they were walking on the streets, but they never arrested anyone. I mean, I was I was just um, um, looking at the videos from the people who were just trying to uh, record everything. But uh, yeah, again, to be fair, there were no like blatant violations or blatant use of violence by the Russian troops there. They, they came there, they did, they, I think they succeeded the operation in four days. So they secured this um, object, they kind of uh, pushed back the demonstrators and, and then everything went uh, okay because also the government pledged um, uh, pledged to establish a new program that would help the poor people in Kazakhstan. So I think to a certain extent, the demands of people were satisfied, at least by the promises. I mean, we'll see, we'll see if they will do this in reality. Uh, so that's how the, that's how the tur turmoil, you know, actually ended. Uh, and then, um, that it was the, that it's Russian Russian interest. Yeah, uh, I, I think I told you as well that uh, I completely think it's uh, it's self interest and Kazakhstan also a rich country, so Russia cannot lose it as a as a supporter as a neighbor. Um, so yeah, definitely they decided to help him uh, to help Tokayev because he requested because uh, they knew that they will need his help later uh, like a, actually a month after right uh, it was a month after when they intervened uh, when they um intervened uh, not intervened uh invaded ukraine but um again interesting interesting fact that uh, kazakhstan decided not to help but we'll see maybe it's just the first first um, maneuver and then we'll see how the situation develops uh, let me just get a. Uh, let me just pose two questions. First, being the CST, or rather, is sort of a, a Cold War, uh, Cold War esque pact of, of sort of a resemblance of, of of NATO, and what we are seeing is NATO perhaps is being rather problematic in terms of its approach, and then seeing seeing the what at least from the Russian perspective as as being the lead lead cause for what's what's happening in Ukraine. The, the tendencies for such a situation in the in the CSTO are rather unlikely, but one one sees the resemblance piece as you pointed in your article as well, in Article 4, which is a sort of a plagiarized version of, of the NATO's Article 5. Uh, so I'd be interested to know more on the history of this organization and how it came to be, or was it sort of a sort of a uh, a supplement or an offspring of the Warsaw Pact itself. That's question one. Uh, okay, let's let's just go question wise. So I'll reserve the others, which are on the use of force and 
and organizations second part but just if you could share your thoughts on on, on this one please mm -hmm. uh, all right so i will just uh, throw this caveat i'm not an expert on csto itself as an organization so i don't know if history but uh, again i think i mentioned this in my presentation uh, the cst the establishment of cst was obviously a response to the nato creation because mm, nobody wanted putin to have to have him in nato and if 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 i remember uh, correctly but they did really come close didn't they nato was i mean there was a relation that you'll have putin as well but there were certain agreements which were not agreeable to the NATO members, then this sort of discussion of NATO plus Russia sort of just mellowed down. Yeah, so th that's what I wanted to say. That uh, I think it's important to remember that Putin once won wanted to become a NATO member himself. He said it's in a Munich uh, security conference. And um, yeah, NATO said, sorry, we don't need you. And then I guess he was like, okay, you're not taking me into your club, I will create my own club. And uh, as you rightly pointed out, he just plagiarized everything <laughs> from the NATO agreement. Also, interestingly, I noticed that yesterday that the logo is very, very similar. The logo of CSTO and logo of, um, of NATO, it's also the compass. <laughs> so I don't know what they were thinking. Um, but uh, yes, so I guess it was the response to you know, this rejection of NATO, not taking Russia into their club. And uh, also because he understood, all oh, right, so they don't want to be friends with me uh, and I have to protect myself. And how can I protect myself? Okay, I will just take this neighboring countries and, and create this organization. And obviously this uh, countries that are surrounding him are Poor countries are not developed, not, not developed countries, but it's what he had left, right? And um, yeah, it's definitely the the response to the NATO creation and the NATO NATO expansion as well, because he wanted to create this um, this alliance to prevent uh, the member states from entering NATO. Uh, for instance, it did not work with Ukraine, right? Or with Georgia. Nobody, like they entered the agreement first and they were like, cool, something is wrong with this organization. And then they withdrew. And I don't know why they withdrew. It's like it happened more than 20 years ago. There might have been different geopolitical issues on the table. Uh, and I'm not aware of them, but I, it's just my feeling that they probably thought, okay, what this organization can bring us, probably nothing. So that's why they withdrew. And uh, also, as I mentioned, the decision making is heavily influenced by Russia. So I think the countries that were trying to, um, to be on the way uh, to their democracies and to building their own statehood, uh, they just couldn't deal with it. And uh, that's why they withdrew. But it's just my it's just my observation. It's, yeah, and, and 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 I just want to I, I mean I didn't reflect in the logo of the STO, so let me just pull it up so that others can also see it as well. And yes, indeed, the <laughs> the, the the resemblance is quite is quite uncanny. And uh, one one sees this plagiarism not really limiting itself to to the the articles, but also to the logo. Um, mm -hmm. And 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 there remains an interesting question, which is also even highlighted in the. In the ch in the chat box, uh, this is it, uh, it is asking about the accountability in the international platforms and what can the UN do. I do point I do point the the the, the questionnaire to, to 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 listen to the podcast by Filipa Web, Marko Mankalanovic, and Professor Kande, who who speak about this in the organizations. But 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 since we have since we have you here, I'll we will pose this question to you as well and the accountability of these organizations. And perhaps I'll also use this opportunity to weave my question in, which is about the use of international organizations. Uh, we've seen so many organizations taking a strong strong stance in the situation, none less than the United than the than the International Court of Justice itself. But we these organizations would would seem to a to a perhaps the limited extent uh, 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 toothless, but course that's also an argument for a different day and we, we need to organize another seminar on that but just to just to uh, gauge how you would expect or understand the 
uh, role of these organizations and what sort of a value will they have on the spectrum of mm -hmm. of persuasiveness effectiveness and uh, enforcement so i mean those are sort of on one side but then if you could mm -hmm. dot the others on the spectrum that would be quite interesting mm -hmm. um i'm also not an expert on nato for instance i barely know know how NATO functions. But uh, I can say that, in my view, the CSTO, the cheap version of NATO, but I also think NATO functions uh, like it uh, barely functions as well. I know that there are some criticism of the organizations as well, but CSTO, and as I, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, that was barely active during all these years. Uh, before the um, before the events in Kazakhstan in 2022, they never deployed troops. It was the organization existed for 20 years, more than 20 years, and uh, what they did in this 20 years, there was basically nothing. So I think this, I think these organizations are a very artificial, uh, artificial alliances. Um, and uh, they are created just a response to another creation of uh, the similar alliances, but their political uh, importance. I think NATO is politically important because it includes the, like the, the most important also actors on the international arena, but organizations like CSTO, uh, yeah look at what what who is uh, who is in the csu okay but it's basically the russian alliance but russia alone cannot do anything so um this is my view on the importance of these organizations i think csu is not important to be honest but um on the question of responsibility of the un uh, i i cannot even imagine oh, in which circumstances the UN or any other uh, accountability avenue would want to prosecute CSTO or any other uh, collective security organization uh, you know as, a, as an entity. I think they would always go um, uh, separately for a violator, for a violator state and uh, moreover I think it's impossible uh, according to international law to bring an account to bring an international organization to accountability because it's it's an artificial creation uh, the state is also an artificial creation but uh, we can impose uh, sanctions on states for instance and i don't think that we can impose sanctions on international organizations but i think if the un is not um, is not satisfied uh, with what the csto does for instance in the future or I don't know in which hypothetical cases they might just with you know withdraw their uh, observer status from the general assembly but i don't think that they can do more and um and i and to be honest i actually don't think that we need a special accountability regime for international organizations they enjoy the immunity and also why if we can go for e each separate state but it's uh, yeah again it's my it's my view i'm not a international organization sex no, no, no. unfortunately <laughs> uh let let me just pose the final question before we close let's speak slightly on the aspect of the use of force and the and and the life of international law as a sort of a substitute or a supplementation of of action we've seen this occur in all sorts of instances even with the current situation and with the with the case which you've discussed an international organization thereby international law was used as a sort of a as a cloak to, to or, or a sort of a modus apprendi to to perform these actions and uh, 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 I, I, what i'm trying what i'm trying to head this argument towards is the creation or sort of a uh, accountability mechanism uh, uh, by 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 countries like the United Kingdom, who who seek a special tribunal to be created uh, uh, to to pro prosecute these 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 people responsible for these for these atrocities and and heinous crimes. But it's rather hypocritical because they were not so long ago involved in a similar instance themselves. Um, and then of course you can discuss the aspect of immunity in in that context as well. But 
even if we do look at a special criminal tribunal to prosecute these individuals in any instance that we've discussed in this presentation do we then look at it from a Cambodia lens or do we then look at it from a, a Yugoslavian lens in terms of how we even structure this court and even if there is any sort of uh, any sort of a, a, a effective result that this will yield uh, any thoughts on that uh, as to the use of international law organizations and a, the language of law to sort of legalize uh, actions uh, which which prime fsi might seem rather disturbing so now you're referring to the language which is used by russians to uh, to invade ukraine or but you can you can you can use any example which you're comfortable with of course the example with the the, the, the presentation which we have today is, is on ah, like using the for foreign terrorist example um, yeah, but I, I think this is actually not even international uh, law uh, language that was used in the situation of Kazakhstan because they were uh, not even saying that, okay, we are going there because, because 51, uh, Article 51, UN Charter, we are going there purely because it's, um, it's the um, rights given to us by the security the CSTO regime framework. Yeah, we were going there because we were invited, because it's a collective security uh, threat. <clears throat> so, and actually, to be honest, uh, I don't have a lot of arguments saying that this was illegal because there are documents. There are documents, uh, parts of this regime that allows these forces to be uh, to be deployed. And as I, uh, as I mentioned, in, answering the previous question, uh, they, they really did their job cleanly. So they really went there, they just uh, uh, surrounded objects. So as much <laughs> probably as I would like to elaborate on violations or why this shouldn't have been done, I cannot refer to any um, to any potential violation that could have appeared in the uh, framework of this situation. But the war in Ukraine is obviously completely different. And uh, we saw, yeah, a lot of contributions that were talking about the use of language uh, to justify uh, your illegal actions. Um, but there are also very important, there are also very interesting contributions that are saying that why, that given the fact that international law is a Western project, and uh, it's also, you know, it was given to us, to lawyers, uh, to for interpretation. Um, yeah, and we were like, even when we are talking to our students, we are trying to teach them how to interpret law, uh, not in a morally, uh, uh, in a morally right way, but in a way that would, I don't know, contribute to your client, for instance. And I'm not saying that uh, I don't see this problematic. Of course, this is problematic what Russia does, but also that's what we are teaching our students to do, using the language of law to benefit your, your own interests or, your, or interests of your clients. So I think, yeah, it's a, I think it's a completely different question and it's, it not relates to, uh, to the topic that we discussed today. But on the establishment of um, of a tribunal, uh, I think uh, I mean I'm in, I'm in favor of uh, international tribunals, and because I think it's a cheaper, I think it's actually a cheaper version uh, of justice. Uh, you know, going to the ICC and uh, and uh, trying to get some justice there. Uh, I think it's a doomed mission, to be honest. But a creation of a special tribunal is, and I don't think that's. Uh, but again, it's a completely different debate. Do we want to enter this? I don't know. Uh, but if you were asking me if there could be a possibility of establishing a military of an um, international tribunal for the CSTO as an organization, first, it's impossible. Second, as I said, there were really no violations that you could prosecute in in such a tribunal. Indeed. Let me, we're almost near the end, so let me just thank you for taking out time to do this. Uh, we're so honored, delighted, and so privileged to be able to hear about this, uh, given the fact that we are in the middle of a, 
uh, uh, perhaps also nearing the end of a war which has devastated so many lives and um, uh, one, one would, would want to invest a minute every day to pray in the memory of those who, who, who've lost, who we've lost and those young innocent lives which are in danger and also the other ancillary uh, lives which will be lost due to this ongoing conflict which is clearly driven by, by, a, by a revision, a revision of, 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 of history and also of, of, of perception. Uh, mm -hmm. That being said, Yulia, I just want to personally thank you for, for doing this and for speaking to us on an extremely important and engaging topic. You've enjoyed your company and uh, I, I enjoy I join Arjun in thanking you and clapping for you uh, for, for, for doing this. Thank you so much. Final words from you and then uh, we can close. Just want to thank you for the invitation and uh, I'm always open to discuss either this topic or any other topic. Uh, you can just drop me an email and, uh, and we can d discuss other things as well. So thank you very much. And uh, I think that's a great thing that you're organizing, uh, you know, uh, this series. I think it's very important to the students as well. And um, I'm really happy to see that there is interest in such things. And I hope, uh, I hope that um, the series will prosper and will bring a lot of benefit to the students. And thank but you so I, much, Anki, for taking care of this. It benefits from the people of your ilk and uh, thank all our participants also for joining this discussion and sharing their questions with, with, with us here and also on, on, on the YouTube channel. Thank you so much and uh, good evening and thank you very much. Yes, have a nice evening. Bye everyone.